Hello and welcome to the Landsat 177 and today we are sitting down with the Minister for Lands and Mineral Resources, Ilinon F. Sorongo. Second year in governance uh, for you as uh, Minister. Let me start with uh, some uh, pointed questions. First of all, you were the Deputy Leader of Sodelpa uh, at the time of joining TAP. Did you make that decision as a gamble or did you see it fit to join uh, Mr. Ramuka? It was a calculated decision. Um, you know, I'd, I'd served uh, as deputy party leader to the Honorable Ngavoka for a year. At the time, I felt that uh, you know, Fiji was looking towards a change in government. And they, everybody that I spoke to, I think, uh, by, by and large, people were feeling uh, that after 16 years, they needed to change. Now, there were options. There were parties, political parties that were available and throwing themselves as alternative governments at the time whether any of them was good enough to substitute the Fiji First Party uh, was the big question. And for me, after one year being with uh, the uh, Social Democrat Liberal Party, I felt that the uh, growing, uh, growing uh, power of uh, the People's Alliance on the ground uh, was the catalyst of that decision for me to join uh, the People's Alliance as an ordinary candidate. So Delpa was uh, burdened with rifts back then when you departed. Was that also a contributing factor for you to uh, leave that party? Yeah, I mean, it was. It was something that uh, was there, but it was also something that I think was, was uh, legacy-based. Uh, you know, it didn't just happen within the few years, within the year that I was there. It was always there since the transition from SDL. Um, it may be... You know, it may be something to do with the uh, constitutional makeup of how the whole party is is organised. Uh, but you know, that's, that's something for uh, the party to deal with. Now. When the coalition agreement was signed, done, and dusted, uh, government was formed in parliament. Were you wanting the position of attorney general? Did you, did you want that position like hundred percent? I was always uh, talking to the. Prime Minister before the uh, um, 24th of December uh, and also talking to people uh, around top leadership of the party. Uh, we had two uh, deputy party leaders and the party leader and so there were very close consultation. Uh, to me, me personally, even if I had set as a, uh, as a backbencher, the important thing was that the change uh, needed to happen. Even if part of us at PAP had to sacrifice our ministerial position, uh, that's secondary to us. Uh, certain, certain secondary to me. Um, but you know, to me, I, like I said, I'm a party man. Uh, wherever the prime minister puts me and uh, believes in me in that portfolio, uh, that's the portfolio that I will take. So you didn't lobby for the AG's position? Never did. Never did? Never did. And you're happy in the current role? Oh yes, I'm happy. How is the current AG doing, according to your assessment? He's doing very well. Very well? Defined? Yeah, he's a great friend of mine. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's doing what needs to be done uh, at the back of 16 years of uh, someone else in that office. Obviously, if you find yourself in his shoes, you will realize that you've got a big job to do. And so he's slowly acclimatizing to what needs to be done and uh, the party looks forward to uh, greater things in the next three years. The purported uh, cabinet reshuffle that the Prime Minister announced named you as AG. Were you aware of that move by the Prime Minister? I was made aware of it, yes. And you readily accepted? Yes. And then the Fiji Law Society came in uh, with a legal aspect of you not qualify you do not be qualified to hold that position you also read that yes i i was made aware of that uh, position by the law society uh it's an opinion like everybody else would have an opinion the final arbiter of any uh, constitutional uh, 
dialogue would be the Supreme Court. Ten lawyers can have ten views. I obviously got view uh, uh, an advice from uh, a law firm that agreed with the decision of the Prime Minister. Um, and so, you know, it's out there that people that can have uh, various decisions, very uh, subtle legal arguments that can, you know, that can be generated out of that, and to a much greater um, argument uh, based on constitutional on constitutionality of provisions, and then also with the, the law that mm. seeks to penalise lawyers, and the language that it uses to penalise lawyers, and whether that language. Uh, you know, marry, ties up to what the constitution uh, requires. Uh, and so, you know, like I said, if uh, the final arbiter is still out there, uh, and so maybe there will be a point uh, in time when uh, that decision needs to be made. And if that decision is made, uh, things are overturned, you will be willing to become the learned AG of AG? Always, always going to be at the back of an appointment uh, by the Prime Minister. The sanction on you by the Independent Legal Services Commission disqualifies you from holding the AG's position, but gives you the, gives you the uh, uh, position of Minister. You can become the Prime Minister. It doesn't gel well? I, uh, you know, this, like I said, these are all things that has to be considered uh, legally. You know, you, if you're allowed to uh, contest as a, as a candidate in an election, you pass the laws that vetoes those that can and cannot. Uh, again, the question is, uh, what more should, uh, you know, should someone subscribe to before uh, becoming uh, a particular minister in, in a particular portfolio? Uh, but that's, I think that's, that's going to be a um, hard talk for another day. Right now, it's business as usual. Okay, uh, talking about business as usual, uh, you're a man, you, you are a man of law, you read law. Is it okay for a convicted uh, drunk driving person to be the chief registrar of this country, of the judiciary? He's been, he's been convicted and he has certainly been sentenced. That sentence has not been appealed. Um, I'm sorry, he's, he's con he has had a recording of non-conviction and he's only been fined with a uh, term of uh, where he's not allowed to drive. Um, it's, not, it's not an unlawful sentence, you know what I mean? It's not a sentence that the law does not allow. Uh, so in other words, there, are, there is a latitude and a sentencing range where the magistrate can impose. And so uh, the magistrate has looked at the range, looked at special circumstances, looked at early guilty plea, and then finally made a decision. Someone's not happy with that decision. They are free to take it up on revision or an appeal. Uh, so if, when there is a non-conviction uh, recorded, uh, then obviously you know, that person is not disallowed from holding that position. That's my view. This is, this is the type of explanation this government should be giving to the public uh, on an issue like this. And the best person to do it is the learned AG who hasn't done it so far. So my question goes back, is the AG doing a good job? No, no, look, it's not, not only on this, I think he's doing a good job on a macro scale. Um, th there are, of course, you know, instances where uh, being, being silent on an issue is perhaps the best response. And so I think that's probably the, uh, the, um, the route that's been taken. Uh, but you got it now, so that's, that's, that's also coming from a government minister. Finally, for this segment, uh, uh, Minister Vosorongo, uh, you have your law firm still operational. Is there a conflict of interest in there? Do you go to your law firm? Do you assist your lawyers there? I don't have a... I don't have... But obviously, I don't appear in court anymore. Uh, but because I am a, the proprietor of the, of the company, uh, and I have um, declared that to uh, uh, the Prime Minister, 
and I've filled out all the necessary form that needs to be uh, there at um, cabinet office. Uh, so I don't deal with uh, anything intimately in the law firm. Thank you very much. We'll take a short break and continue the discussion on the other side. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back, and uh, Minister Vosorongo, let's uh, speak uh, uh, specifically about uh, mineral resources, uh, mines, uh, to start off this segment. The loss of your director mines recently, uh, 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 Raymond, that's a huge loss for the ministry and maybe personally for you. Can you speak about it? Yeah, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible loss to the ministry, uh, particularly to the Department of uh, Mineral Resources. Ray has uh, held the fort for four and a half years when uh, Pete was away in Japan and acted as uh, as director of MRT for that period of time. Pat is back, uh, but it seems like, you know, Ray is just waiting for Pat to, to come back and, and hand him over the reins. Um, he's a big loss. Uh, he's, a, he's a walking memory. You know, he's a walking institution. He has institutional memory of uh, the Mineral Resource Department. Highly intelligent individual. Uh, and someone that you can either pick up the phone and you ask him about uh, you know, Amata Cement, everything that you need to know, development minerals, and minerals underground, so where they are deposited, where do you think you know, Fiji has a, has a large scale deposit of mineral resources where we can uh, advise on mining activities. He knows it, he, you know, he has it at the back uh, of his hands. So uh, the loss of Ray has been uh, monumental for us, uh, and I'm sure that uh, you know the uh, direct uh, mineral resources uh, would miss him. Um, I also hope that you know in the period of time that people under Ray has you know they've understudied him, they've learned from him, and so they we could minimize the the uh, and also mitigate that loss by having people to step up. And, uh, and answer the call uh, for an, an in the mineral resource department. Mm. A number of uh, mines are currently operational in Fiji. A number of licenses are, are on the waiting list to be issued. Tied to that is the landowner's interest. What are you finding out now? Uh, what happened in the previous administration, past 16 years? How landowners have been treated in regards to issuance of mining licenses under the ministry? Right. The so negative stuff. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So the caveat is that, but my the caveat that I want to uh, impose on this discussion is we were not there when, you know, when the SPLs, the issuance were, were issued, were done. And the discussions that led up to it. But what we know now is that when we're going back to do consultation, renewal of SPLs, well, we're finding very disturbing stories of encounters they had with the previous administration uh, that you know at times uh, they would come and they would say look SPL is going to be issued uh, regardless of whether or not you're going to say yes or no. Uh, so with some of these ones that we're dealing with right now that has had a long story to it mm -hmm. for example the Namosi joint venture project it's been it's been more than a decade you know with They've been running this exploration for more than a decade. And now the uh, SPL is up for renewal again. It's not necessarily a requirement of law that we would consult with the landowners because it's just exploration. It's when we get to the SPL issuance that that's when we need to tie up you know, a lot of things with the landowners. Uh, but I thought that we would go and examine what was it what is it that the landowners feel right now about uh, these SPLs? And also with uh, Mankasi. Uh, and we're finding that you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, animosity that's you know, built up over years. 
And so now, even in our first meeting, yeah. they, they treated us, I, I suppose, quite right, rightfully. Mm. They treated us as the government in, you know, in, in, in uh, uh, that's continued on, uh, without realizing that you know there are different players now. But they say to us the same things that they had said. You know, we we told you the last time not to renew. They say all sorts of things. Uh, but that just tells me one thing. That tells me that you know the the proper foundation, the, the, you know, what needed to be done in the first place was that expanse of consultation that had to go far and wide mm. with as much detail as possible so that people will need to understand exactly how exploration is going to affect the environment, affect their livelihood, how it can be minimized and what the undertakings are there from the company that the government will ensure is going to happen mm. and be facilitated so that there is always harmony in this three-party uh, dialogue. There is the government that needs to sit there and facilitate landowners' interests as well as the company. We want to, uh, we want to improve and also encourage investments in Fiji. Mm. And part of it is getting the landowners on board. Uh, you can't get the landowners on board if you have a heavy-handed government. So there must be, you know, you're going to have to find the right balance. And there's always a halfway in between. I've always thought that, you know, the best way to deal with things is to sit down and have a dialogue or run a round table. No one's exerting too much power in that discussion. Uh, and once the, uh, the least of the parties, you know, the least powerful of the parties uh, is well and good and satisfied with the discussion, mm -hmm. that's where you can start kicking off on the, on the project. So it's at that, those delicate stages mm -hmm. at the moment. You know, we're trying to harmonize uh, consent, we're trying to harmonize the landowners uh, buy in to these things because there is a lot of economic benefit that comes out of this. Mm -hmm. Tuvatu, for example, you know, we've seen mm -hmm. that uh, line one gold uh, mine, we, uh, we commissioned that on, on Fiji Day, mm. on the 10th of October. It's providing, uh, you know, it's providing um, people with uh, employment. It's, it, the, the impact of it is going to go, you know, it's going to be felt around Nandi area. Mm. And so those are the kind of things that we want to encourage, mm. in addition to landowners getting their fair share and also government uh, being rewarded for the, re for the award of the mining lease. Are you finding out uh, special prospecting licenses were given out uh, illegally under the table? <laughs> no. Under the previous government? No, no. None, not, has, not, none has been reported to me yet. Okay. Yeah. And are you digging to find out? If there, is, if there are some suggestions that some have been, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm not on a witch hunt to find this out if people feel that some of it you know were um, unduly issued uh, or not issued according to uh, um, uh, operating procedures of the department then uh, you know they feel free to, to make a complaint and, and come and see me about it. You spoke about aggrieved landowners how long will it take for you to get the landowners on your side to understand what mining is about? Look, I, I, I don't uh, think that it's going to be an easy task, uh, but I also don't think that it's going to be impossible. I think uh, everything needs time. Uh, with some lead owners, the uh, wound has been deep, and that you need to, you know, you have to dress up and cover things and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Which means that a lot more things has to happen between the three uh, three-way party um, we're beginning to build that and we want to build that relationship so that there is much confidence in these projects and the confidence we need is only going to be come manageable because uh, when we have landowners who are happy about things that are happening investor who's happy about what they're going to get and government was happy to facilitate. Are the landowners currently asking for more money uh, on their land for mining leases or 
do they want more uh, in regards to social impact uh, responsibility by the company that's coming in? What are you seeing? There's, there's always going to be uh, social responsibility implications for these mining companies and I think uh, none of them uh, don't know about it. It's just part of your, uh, of your incursion responsibilities. But I think uh, you know people these days are more uh, more concerned about environmental issues. Well, with the Mosi, one of the main things that that's come out is over the years there's been a lot of uh, environmental damages, mm. uh, which we on file would think that uh, it was reported or has been mitigated and has been resolved. But for landowners, they think that the past administration were just not urgent enough in addressing them when it happened. Uh, and so those are the kind of things that we need to start dealing with them right now. Mm. Is giving them the assurance that government will perform its monitoring role and its regulatory functions as well as engaging with uh, the company to stick to what's on black and white with what we have agreed with, with, uh, with mm -hmm. the um, So, uh, like I said, it's it's a hard task at the moment, but not an impossible. Mm -hmm. During your consultations, uh, are you finding uh, landowners or Matangali, uh, traditional landowners uh, who are greedy for money? Uh, we want this, we want more, we want more, and then we will agree. Are you seeing that trend? Uh, not to that extent, not to that extent. I think, uh, you know, landowners by and large would just want to make sure that they get a fair share of what they are entitled to. Um, and uh, government's job is to make sure that that's exactly what they will get. Within uh, what the law requires, of from the project and not from government. Over and above that, there's always this, uh, just as an arrangement between the landowners and uh, and the companies on you know, certain projects they want to do with the village, the Abusa, the Matangali. You know, that for that, that's up to them to, mm -hmm. to decide and negotiate on their own. Uh, but for us, we just want to make sure that what is due to landowners is what they get. Mm -hmm. This process of getting the landowners agreeing with the company, company agreeing with the landowners, does it get worse than when lawyers get involved? I have not come across in a situation where it's been worsened by lawyers. I think lawyers play a great role uh, in making sure that you know, landowners side of things are taken care of. Their entitlements are covered under whatever agreements is entered into. And so the role of lawyers is very important. Uh, and like I said, you know, I have not had an opportunity to come across one where lawyers have been the cause of dissonance. Mm -hmm. Finally, for this segment, uh, Minister, uh, if I had to ask you to give two most uh, uh, biggest obstacles in the mining industry, mineral resources industry currently in Fiji, what are these two biggest obstacles in the industry? Oh, I think we've just talked about them. I think we've just talked. Uh, we've just talked about the, um, uh, you know, the consent landowners uh, issue, uh, which has always uh, and and by design. I think that's how it should be. If you get over that big first hurdle, then you know everything else should go smoothly. But I think that big first hurdle is there by design. You need to make sure that all of these things are covered before you start the operations. So there's no point in you know, commencing with the bigger operations and spending a lot more money in order to get that operation going. And you still have these unresolved issues. Uh, and then you know, over time, it becomes bigger and bigger. And so by the time, for example, when we inherit uh, government after 16 long years, or well, the Fiji First uh, Party in government, that's uh, what you get. Mm -hmm. You get uh, um, landowners who would come to you and say it's an accused government of being of siding with the with the you know, with the with the investor, uh, heavy-handed tactic with the investors uh, over them. 
uh, and siding with investors. So that's one of the one of the key things that I see. With other, the other part is, uh, you know, uh, just whether Fiji uh, is uh, to be known as a um, as a mining country, or whether it should not be. I mean, we have we've got three uh, we've got gold mining in Vatukula. That's um, Today is 88 years old or 89 years old, and uh, it has a mining plan for the next uh, 20 years. So it will be one of those one of those mines that will exceed 100 years, or probably one of the oldest mines in the world today. Uh, and Tuvatu looks very promising. Mount Kasi is at the edge of negotiation with uh, with the landowners. Uh, so we have three gold mines, and we're hoping you know, for uh, uh, the Mosi and a couple of SPLs are also under, sorry, a couple of exploration licenses are also uh, taking place uh, in the country. There is one up in the north, uh, one in Serua, and one in the highlands of Wittilin. Uh, exploratory at the moment, you know, they're looking at uh, for various uh, minerals in Fiji. Uh, but we, the minerals department only contribute 2% to our GDP. And so, uh, we want to see that that percentage increases, uh, but not increase at the cost of environment and not increase at the cost of landowners' uh, rights in Chapel. When you're dealing with the license, uh, who do you represent um, more, the government or the landowner? Whose interest are you looking at? Uh, like I said, the government is a facilitator. We lay down the regulatory framework. We lay down the requirements to the uh, investor, and we also get the landowners to try and understand what we are trying to do. The government's role is to expand the business confidence and the investor confidence in the country. So if an investor has, a, has, a, has expertise and has interest in mining, our role is to try and see that that gets facilitated. So uh, we we're, we're try as much as we can to remain in a neutral position where we can facilitate the discussion and also facilitate as much as we can how an investor dollar can improve the livelihood of those that are ultimately going to benefit, mm -hmm. either whether they be employees or whether that dollar is ultimately going to fall to the hands of the landowners. Mm -hmm. Under your watch, uh, no landowner will be shortchanged? Oh no, no, that's, that's not going to happen. We're going to make sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you, Minister. We'll take a short break and continue the discussion on the inside. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back to the Landsat 177 and today we are talking to the Minister for Lands and Mineral Resources, Philemon Evasarongo. Let's start with uh, the other portfolio you hold. You look after land, state land specifically. At any government cons consultation, land comes up. The Fijians bring up the issue of land and most of it is to deal with processing of applications, backlog of applications. Mm. Where, where is the ministry on this in terms yeah. of getting these backlogs uh, sorted? That's, the, uh, that's been the biggest challenge. And I think that's been the biggest challenge for the ministry for many, many years. Uh, decades, if I'm not wrong. Um, and, the, uh, and the answer, as I said in an earlier interview, the answer is, uh, to me, is simple. Coming from a private sector background. The answer is to, is to uh, speed up the process. And you can't speed up the process with the same platform that you have. The, uh, the, 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 the key thing that needs to happen now, and we're already working towards that, is to have all of these things digitized. Uh, Ministry of Lands has to turn digital from application to approval. Uh, 
our in-house developers are working on some of these platforms that when developed individually, uh, at some point we're going to integrate them and that would form your start to finish uh, of any application process. We're not, we're, we're a part of uh, a whole scheme of uh, government processes, right? From uh, Investment Fiji to us, if investors are looking for land, say for example, for hotel and integrated development, they've identified a piece of land that's sitting with us. Uh, we work on either that or for sure development, you know, all of that. If it moves from um, uh, Investment Fiji to us, and uh, that's where it takes up a lot of time. And from us, it then moves to DTCP. Or it moves to uh, one of the local governments. If it's sitting in Nandi, Olotoka, or Suva, Lambasa. And so we may finish our part, uh, but the investor who started off with Investment Fiji wouldn't know unless he, you know, digs digs into all of this process where that application is actually seated mm -hmm. right, so he would go come to us and we'll say oh it's with the off to DTCP now it goes to DTCP and then it goes somewhere and that's where the frustration builds up mm -hmm. so I think the process the answer to this is well, I think we already know it the answer to this is to find a centralized platform where an investor would know exactly where his application is doesn't necessarily have to chase it up. You're given a tracking number, you type that into an e-portal and then it gives you, it's sitting at the TCP and it has been there from, for example, from the 2nd of January, right? And you might say, okay, I'll give the, that department two, three days and it should leave that office to go to another because if it doesn't, I pick up the phone. And call. These are the, this is the ease of business that we've been talking about. Yeah? Not just this government, the past government has been talking about, previous governments have been talking about. But we have to find that solution. I think that solution is really, everything has to be digital. Of course, there are in some instances where we have to, we have to uh, um, still maintain the uh, ordinary way of filing an application. Uh, but by and large, the most, most of what we are receiving has to move towards digital uh, platform. Mm -hmm. And it just can't happen with LANS alone, because LANS is, like I said, is just a part and parcel of an entire scheme of, of government processes. And this is where mostly the uh, investment, investor confidence is lagging, because they might come to us and they say, they praise us, okay, okay, it's gone past LANS and we're very happy. But it's sitting mm -hmm. somewhere else. And then from there, it's sitting somewhere else, and then it, when it goes to Survey General, goes to Titles Office, these may take months. Mm -hmm. And by that, you're losing the confidence of investors every single day that that happens. Mm -hmm. I think uh, once we head down that road, and every other government department heads down that road, we have a centralized platform where we can all perform this single duty. Mm -hmm. Investor confidence will rise, and uh, we will you know, begin to have uh, both investment and employment creation in the country. Do you hope to achieve this centralized uh, system in your first term in office? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, do with you us, yes. Do you have a time frame uh, next with, year? With, lands, uh, with the lands department, uh, you know, we started working on uh, digitizing all the leases that have been issued, all the leases that have been issued. So we're working on bringing them into the uh, e-platform. And also, uh, in March, we launched a, we launched a uh, online services uh, application process, where for all state leases that I advertise, you apply online. So we're dealing with those that were all paperwork before, mm -hmm. and at the same time, we're saying for these new ones, you have to apply online, and you you know everything is going to be registration and all of that is going to be done online. And then we're working on towards, uh, say for example, linking us to DTCP and linking us to Severe Gentle and as well as Titles Office. So it's a lot more work. Um, certainly outside of lands will be a lot more work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would have to take care of my side of the, you know, my portfolio. 
and other ministers who have those responsibilities will have to take part. But we have to coordinate mm -hmm. and to ensuring that our platform and their platform at some point in time can come together and we can have that, uh, that flow that, uh, that the country needs. Mm -hmm. So I have to take you back to the last 16 years again. Uh, are you finding cases of visas that were issued uh, uh, illegally uh, uh, to those who did not deserve it? Well, I'm not finding cases where uh, things were illegally issued. Uh, but there are cases where I've you know, sort of questioned how it was issued. Uh, uh, and like I said, I mean, if you come with a, as a lawyer, I come with a fresh lens on. So I come and I, uh, you know, I've questioned that and this, that, you know, you know by and large, it's not really an illegality issue. I think at some point, uh, in some of the things that I discover, uh, there may have been a, one or two things overlooked, uh, but not necessarily criminal in nature. Housing, agriculture, uh, investors, they need state land. Uh, if you were to go from first to third, who would you give the state land to first? Sec state land yeah. is needed for housing, agriculture, yeah. uh, in, in invested need. So if I had to ask you to rank yeah. first to third, yeah. who would you give the land, state land first to? Well, it and depends. Why? <laughs> yeah, it depends on the, uh, it depends on, uh, the need and the location. Uh, l for example, in Nandi, the preference would be in providing state lands that are available to hotel and integrated development purposes. Um, and Nandi is an expanding town, so housing becomes mm -hmm. second, and agriculture you know, becomes third. Uh, it will not be the same, for example, in these other areas of Fiji, we will find state lands uh, particularly here in the Suva Nosori corridor, housing, of course, is is a big issue. Mm -hmm. So, state lands that are available in this corridor are going to be marked for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a uh, a uh, beltway for agriculture, or at least not within the periphery of the towns. So, uh, agriculture will take the last uh, the last spot. If there are excess lands, and it's good to issue for hotel and uh, integrated development, then that's going to be uh, something that we will consider. Many don't know uh, picnic spot Bukalau Falls on Tayoni District. Mm. What, do you have plans to develop that place? Uh, if so, what are the plans or is it going to remain like that? Well, it's, uh, there were some plans uh, you know, to make uh, the accommodations there uh, a lot more uh, conducive. Uh, but we now we have to we we're going to have to uh, have a roundtable discussion with uh, because now we have uh, since the uh, government day celebration that was celebrated uh, this year uh, we also have to consider that as well because uh, it's now uh, considered to be part of uh, history of Fiji uh, and the historical sites you, you want to have to talk with people and decide whether you know it's you could put uh, modern development there or is it supposed to remain uh, archaic in, in looks and in shape um, but it is uh, it certainly is a big uh, investment portfolio for us mm -hmm. it's, uh, and we also have been talking with the rail provincial council you know, they traditionally they that land or the island uh, belonged to them uh, over some of their commercial uh, projects and you know we also are looking at that facilitating that uh, just wanted to make sure that you know it becomes useful to them as well uh, because they are after all uh, you know, the tradition what what, what are they proposing oh cultural center uh, stopovers for tourists uh, we want to get tourists into Suba uh, you know, we're starved of, of tourist activities in Suba. Mm. Uh, we've got an island of two very close to each other that we can, you know, we can develop. Uh, but if we can develop that with a, uh, with a taste of uh, Rewan tradition and Rewan food and 
their own culture. You know, I think it makes a more meaningful visit. Mm. Final question, Minister. Uh, what is the legacy you want to leave behind uh, when you depart office, maybe at the end of first term or the second term? Well, I, I want to be uh, known as the minister who's, uh, you know, who have been uh, good and kind to staff. Uh, I know that you're asking about uh, projects and things like that, but at the end of the day, we leave our legacies with people. Uh, and that's what I want to be known for. Uh, a father figure in the ministry uh, who is able to guide those that are under me uh, and also encourage those that you know, are falling by the wayside. Uh, there are those that uh, you know, who's come up for performance review and you find you know, this guy will go home if he or she continues with his attitude. And those are the kind of things where you know, the humanity aspects of us kicks in. And I'd want to be known uh, as a good minister uh, to everybody in the ministry. Apart from the work that we will all do, to do together, uh, I want them to remember me uh, as a minister who has been uh, good to them. And uh, will you continue in politics? Or one day you'll say, uh, in 2026, that's it, I want to go back to... Hello, I, I <laughs> I've been, uh, I tell you, uh, uh, the honest answer is I have not made up my mind in 2026. Um, I'm missing practice a lot uh, and you know I have a passion uh, to be in practice um, but We'll see. Just imagine I'm the Prime Minister and I'm telling you, really, you have to <laughs> contest again. What's your response if the Prime Minister will ask you? Uh, look, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a, a discussion that uh, I, I'm definitely going to have with him and have with others who, have, you know, who I look to for advice uh, and for guidance. Uh, it's also something that I will have to consult with my family, uh, my wife and my kids uh, into what collectively is the shape of our uh, family moving forward. Mm. Uh, and if it's the law firm, it will be the law firm. It's politics and politics. Mr. Vosorongo, thank you very much for speaking to me. Thank you.